today on Living Power. We are to pray, we are to bless, and to be a blessing to other people. So, next time you feel like throwing yourself a pity party, take inventory, determine what you've done lately to cause others to praise God. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Let's, let's go to the Lord and give him this time in prayer. Father, I thank you for your truth, for your word that gives us uh, light, that gives us hope, that gives us wisdom, that gives us insight. And today, as we conclude this series, I pray, Father, that you'll really bring it home to help us to understand that you have always had a plan for our life and that you are, are pleased when that plan comes together and our lives are fulfilled and our destiny is fulfilled as you have planned it. So give us that understanding and that wisdom, I pray, as we seek your face and we seek your word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so get yourselves uh, your, your Bibles and uh, pens and paper. And uh, for those of you who are studying on Facebook, you know, of course, that uh, we will load the scriptures up in the, in the chat area as, uh, as we go along. But uh, if you have your Bibles, you can always make notes, and that, that's always kind of nice to do. If you're on the uh, phone patch with us, then um, I'll tell you the scriptures, and you can just kind of make those notes and then go back over your notes. Uh, let me encourage you to go back, uh, since we're concluding our series today, if you've missed any of the, the series, the six lessons in this series, I would encourage you to go back and find that. It's, it's on the Facebook page. And uh, or on the, uh, the the YouTube channel, depending. You might be watching from the YouTube channel. Um, it's there, and you'll be able to find it. And uh, watch those lessons because all of these six foundations uh, depend on the previous one. So we started with foundation number one, uh, which was God brings light to your darkness, and this is all based on the uh, the six days of creation. Every day represented. Uh, a new foundation for life that we can apply in our own life and each one uh, the next one builds on the previous one in other words so the first one was God brings light to your light to your darkness uh, foundations for life number two was that you will have challenges and blessings foundations for life number three is that God meets needs foundations for life number four is that God reveals himself foundations for life number five is that God blesses his creation and today we get into foundation number six, which I'll tell you uh, what it is in just a moment. But it's in Genesis uh, chapter one, starting with uh, verse 24 and going through uh, verse 31. And here's what it says. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. That's Genesis chapter 1 verses 24 through 31. So, on the fifth day of creation, uh, God created the birds and the fish. We saw that last Sunday. And now on the sixth day, he completes his design by creating warm-blooded life on the land and some cold-blooded. He created uh, the reptiles also on this particular day. The amazing thing is how much work 
had to go into the preparation for the sixth day. It's a testament to God's plan and, and design that he followed such a, a meticulous strategy to create the earth and to make it inhabitable for mankind uh, who hadn't even been invented, hadn't been created yet. But God knew what he was up to, God knew what his plan was, and he put it together. And remember, the earth was created perfect. God's original intent was to create something beautiful and perfect and eternal. And the earth and all that God did in the creation was perfect and eternal. And the way God set destiny in motion was for eternal, uh, for eternity. And that gives us insight to the sixth day of creation and to the sixth foundation of life, which is God created man to manage eternity. God created man to manage eternity. Now, I want to give some clarity to what God created on the sixth day, as defined in, in Genesis uh, 1, verses 24 and 25. Uh, the, the Hebrews organized animals into three classes, uh, which they called behema, which was the, the cattle and the animals capable of labor or domestication, which uh, also included horses. By the way, that also includes pets. And so, and remember, God created the earth perfect. And so I've, I had this discussion with somebody else uh, earlier this week. They were talking, well, do you think there are going to be um, animals, you know, in, in heaven? Well, God created the earth perfect, and he created it with animals. So animals apparently fit into God's perfection. Except maybe cats. I'm not sure about those. But I'm kidding. Don't send me hate mail. Um... So God cre created it perfect, and it and there were animals, and I fully expect there to be animals in heaven because heaven is perfect, and that's God's concept of perfection. So yes, um, we will, uh, we will see animals. Um, the second, uh, so the first category was was those cattle and animals uh, capable of labor and domestication. The third, uh, the second category is Remy's. Remy's was the uh, the creeping things, the 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 reptiles, the the serpents, the snakes, uh, smaller mammalia, um, and then there was Che, which were the beasts of the earth. Those were the wild beasts, and the, that would be like the lions and the tigers and that sort of thing. And then finally, God creates man, or as the Hebrew calls him, Adam, and he created man in his own image. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. Now, I want you to notice the plurality of verse 26. God uses the term, let them. When he refers to it, it says that he created man, and he says, let them. Does that mean that God created several people at the same time? No. Genesis 5 explains it this way. Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2, which is another uh, uh, perspective of the creation. Uh, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. So when God says them uh, in, our, in our passage in, in Genesis 1, 24 and, 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 and so on, uh, when God says them, he's referring to, get this, he's referring to the eternality of man and his lineage. He's not referring just to Adam. He's referring to what eventually would become the family of man, humankind. Now think about this. The word them includes you. It includes me. It includes us. We are created by God for his purpose and his plan. And that is exactly the conclusion that the worshipers around the throne of God in the book of Revelation refer it to. In Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That's all things, not just at the very beginning, but all things were created by God. That includes you. You were created by God. You are part of that word, them, that God refers to. But what does in his own image mean? We are created with God's nature. That is, that is part of what that, that means. In Ephesians 4, uh, starting with verse 22, we see this. You were taught to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, 
and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That was God's intent all along. We're not created to carry the nature of the ungodly. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 5, says this, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, the sexual immorality, the impurity, the passion, the evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So God intended you to carry on his character, his nature. Now why did God do that? Because he wanted to relate to us. He wanted to connect with us. That was God's intention all along, to have a creation that he could fellowship with. In fact, uh, you've heard me say before, the reason God sent Jesus to pay the price for our sin was, so that he, was because he couldn't stand the idea of spending eternity without you. He can't, he can't stand that idea of spending eternity without you, without me. He wants a relationship with us, and that's what it means. He created us in his image so that we could connect and relate and understand and commune with him. Now, Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28, says something very important. It says, God gives you a calling. God gives you a calling. There, he created you in his image, and by creating you in his image, he had a plan and something that he wants to accomplish in and through your life. So look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now I want you to do a, a little exercise here. We've already established that the word them refers to you, refers to me. I want you to read that passage with you. In the word, instead of the word them. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created you. And God blessed you. And God said to you, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The problem is that we have neglected that. We have negated that by our sin, to be honest. And so we don't have dominion over the earth anymore. We've lost that dominion because of sin. But it's still God's intent. It's still God's plan. God still wants to accomplish something in and through your life that, that brings his purpose and plan to fruition. Now, I want you to see three things in this passage in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And we'll actually look at verse 26 also in a moment. But I want you to see three things that this passage teaches us. Number one... You are a created being. You didn't just happen. You weren't an accident. Uh, you, you, you know, we often hear parents talk about, well, she, she was a little surprised. He was, a, he was an accident. You know, no, you weren't. God created you. He had a purpose and a plan for you all along. You are part of that them that we've, that we've been looking at. And you are designed by God for his purposes. This is so incredibly important to understand. Uh, when God's creation of man was put in place, it was by his design that you would be born in the order of things that you were born in so that you would exist in this day and this time in this place at this point in history. He didn't design that process for you to be born a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago, or a thousand years from now. He designed that and he designed you to be born at this point in history for his purpose and his plan at, at this time. And it was also his design that you would be part of the family in which he placed you. Now get this. He designed that you would be part of the family in which he placed you either naturally or by circumstances such as adoption. 
Now, I want to bring this up because um, some of you know my story. I'm adopted. And uh, just recently, uh, I discovered my, my birth family. And I discovered so much about what God uh, shielded me from. It was a very difficult situation that my birth mother brought me uh, to life in. A very complicated, difficult situation that could have turned out to be absolutely disastrous. And it, now I look back on it, and I look at it, and I see God's hand in my life. He had a purpose and a plan. And so when I talk to kids that are adopted and talk to adoptive parents, I really want to bring this home that it is God's will not he, he doesn't he doesn't judge us by our circumstances he judges us by our purpose and our plan that's his that's his design for our life and so you are part of the family that god put you in either naturally or such as the circumstances might suggest as in adoption and the bible has a lot to uh uh, to support the concept of God-willed adoption. I'm just throwing this in here. It's a little parenthetical study in our look here in Genesis. But I, I really want you to get this because I know so many people uh, deal with this and, and uh, so many, so many uh, uh, people are struggling with their adoption thinking, well, you know, that was a mistake. I shouldn't exist. What's, what's going on? I want you to see that God uh, has a will for adoption. He intended adoption. There are biblical examples of that. Exodus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Look at this. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away. Now this is Moses. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. So Moses was adopted. That's in Exodus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, by the way. But also, look at this story in uh, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 11, starting with verse 11. But uh, Josheba, Josheba, uh, the daughter of the king Jehoram, took Joash. Now Joash is a, was a was a good king, and uh, but this is where it started. His life started. Uh, Josheba, the daughter of the king of Jehoram, took Joash, son of Azariah, uh, Hazariah, uh, Haziah. <laughs> oh man, these names! And uh, he was the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the royal princes who were about to be murdered, and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Because Jehosheba, the daughter of the king of Jehoram, and wife of the priest of Jehoiada, was Ahaziah's sister, she hid the child from Athaliah, so she could not kill him. Athaliah had decided that she was going to destroy the royal family, and so she was killing off members of the family. And so uh, Jehosheba took Joash, and hid him away. Now, a few chapters later, we see this, because jo jo uh, Joash was, was heir to the throne, and as he grew, uh, it was obvious that's the way they did things. So in, in 2 Chronicles 24, uh, starting with verse 1, Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord in the days of Jehoiada the priest. Now, Joash uh, was, was taken out of this royal family, but he was adopted, we think, by Zubiah of uh, Beersheba. Or she may have been the nursemaid who took care of him. And so he is, the, the, the lineage claims her as his mother, as opposed to who his father was. He was apparently adopted. So never let it be said that God doesn't use adoptions to accomplish his will. Um, it doesn't matter the circumstances. You are part of his plan. You are intentional. God intended you for this place, this day, this time, this purpose in history. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your abilities or inabilities, uh, God uh, has a plan and you fit into that. So. The second thing we need to understand is not only are you are, that, you are, that you are created by God, that God had a plan and purpose for your life, but you are also blessed by God. 
Now, we studied this last Sunday, and I hope that you um, didn't miss the study, but if you did, go back and watch it, because it really deals with the fact that God wants to bless us, and how do you receive a blessing? And God says you are blessed. Uh, now, a blessing is that which causes God to be praised. So, um, God says that you are blessed. He will do things in your life that will cause you to praise Him. He will put other people in your life that will cause you to praise God. God has created you with the ability to cause others to praise God. God has this blessing cycle. He wants to bless you, but he wants you to be a blessing also. Remember the covenant that, and the calling that God made with Abraham. It was in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. So the idea was that I will make you, a, uh, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. You say, well, how does that apply to us? Isn't that for the, for the Jews? Well, remember what's taught in Galatians. Galatians 3, verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So, yes, the blessing is for you. God in included you. It came, through, it came through Abraham, but you are the recipient of the blessing, and you also bear the responsibility of the blessing, and that is to be a blessing. That's one of the things that God has in store for you. God has intentionally designed you um, and given you abilities and opportunities to bless others, to cause others to praise God. One of the reasons people feel empty and meaningless is because they're not fulfilling that for which they are designed, which is to cause God to be praised. Let me ask you, when was the last time you did something in somebody's life to cause them to praise God? When was the last time somebody did something in your life to cause you to praise God? We are to pray, we are to bless, and to be a blessing to other people. So, next time you feel like throwing yourself a pity party, take inventory, determine what you've done lately to cause others to praise God. The third thing that we see in this passage is that you have authority. Then God said, it's in Genesis uh, verse 26, uh, 1, 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Dominion is the word. And the idea is uh, authority. The them of verse 26 that we just read refers to us, the lineage of Adam. We're to rule, to have authority over the earth. And God wants the earth to be productive and full of life. As a matter of fact, last... Uh, Last uh, Sunday, we talked a little bit about that. Isaiah says in, in uh, chapter 45, verse 18, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it, he established it, he did not create it empty, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The idea was that the earth was to be fruitful. And so what God is saying in Genesis 1 is that the earth is to be alive and healthy and productive, as we saw last week in, in Genesis 1, verses 21 and 22. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Now, we... I have been given authority to make sure that happens. We have been given that responsibility. We're to take care of that. Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them, that's the, the lineage of Adam, that's you and me, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, I'm not jumping on the Save the Earth campaign. There are far too many inappropriate agendas on that wagon. But I am saying that we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the earth and its population of humans and animals and plants. And when we violate that and allow people to starve to death, 
because there isn't enough food, or we annihilate a species of animal because of our own greed or self-centeredness, we violate our calling. No child or woman or man should starve to death on this earth. It has been designed by God to feed and prosper every individual. And if God's people don't stand for caring for the earth and its inhabitants, who will? We have a great responsibility to be good stewards of what God has put us in, in charge of. But there's an even greater truth and principle to all of this. And that is that the reason why we've been created, blessed, and given authority is this foundation number six, that God created man to manage eternity. Now, I want you to, to take a look at this uh, uh, seven things about preparing for eternity. Because God has created us to be a managers of, of the earth and managers of, of, uh, of his creation. And the Bible teaches that he is going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and we are going to reign with him, the Bible says. We're going to have responsibility to take care of his creation. And so we have to be prepared. We have to be planning for what it is that God wants to do in our life. We have to be preparing ourselves now for what he wants us to learn now so that we'll be ready when he wants to use us in eternity. So how do you prepare for eternity? I want to look at seven things that we need to understand uh, about eternity. Number one, life on earth is preparation for eternity. Life on earth is preparation for eternity. Matthew 19, 16 says this, And behold, a man came up to him, to Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? I was a young ruler, young man, apparently very well-to-do, and uh, um, he wanted to make sure that he had eternal life, wanted to live for eternity. And Jesus answers him, and he says in verse 21, if you would be perfect, in other words, complete, if you really want to complete your destiny and your role in life, go, sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. What Jesus was saying was exactly what Genesis 1 says. You are called, you are blessed, and you have authority, and you are to fulfill that so that you'll be ready for eternity. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. The Bible teaches that it's just perfectly acceptable as long as it doesn't harm you and doesn't uh, come between you and God. Nothing wrong with having wealth, but you are to use it appropriately. You are to use it to glorify God. You are to use it to be a blessing. And what Jesus was saying was that you are called to that, and you, and you are to bless others, and in doing so, you are to learn how to fulfill what you are to do for eternity. Second thing I want you to see is that life is full of what I call eternity quizzes. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 25. In, in uh, verse 37, he was teaching about... Um, the, the judgment, actually. Uh, so in Matthew 25, starting with verse, verse 37, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Jesus had said, when you see me hungry and, and, and thirsty and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and naked and so forth and so on, and you clothed me and all those that you, you did the right thing. When they were saying, well, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. But to those who did not fulfill their calling, to those who were not a blessing, to those who did not fulfill their authority, he said in Matthew 25, starting with verse 45, then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So what God is teaching us is that we are preparing for eternity now. We are learning about eternity, the attitude, the character, the nature of eternity now. And listen, I've said this before, it's purely, purely theoretical on my part, but God says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. 
He's got this vast cosmos now with all the planets and, and who knows what, what else is, is out there. And he's, he's, he wants to make it perfect. Well, he already showed us what perfection is when he created the earth initially. And so we have to assume that the rest of the cosmos at some point is going to be like that because that is perfection. So um, we have to assume that we are, if we're going to reign with God, then we apparently are going to have some responsibility for all of, the, all of that that he creates, the new creation that God's going to make, as taught in Revelation. So part of that comes from that, that responsibility of understanding who we are and our role to bless, to be blessed and to bless, and to take care of people, as he was talking about in Matthew, the people that, that have needs. Every one of these people that he talks about in Matthew are people with needs. Lord, when did we see you hungry? There's a need. And thirsty? There's a need. When did we see you a stranger? There's a need. Uh, naked? Uh, people who have needs? And that's a need. When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Those are all needs and responsibilities that we are to have and to, um, to let God use us to accomplish his purpose and to be a blessing on the earth today. The third thing that I want us, want us to see as we prepare for eternity is that what you do here on earth affects your eternity. Uh, Romans 2, verses 6 and 7 says this, He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. So yes, you, you are uh, affecting eternal life your eternal life now here on earth. Think of it as a, a boot camp for eternity. That's the way to think of earth. That we're, we're in preparation for eternity. Now, when this says, according to his works, uh, verse 6, it's the word ergon, and it means labors. It implies a lifestyle, not just a few good deeds here and there to score a few points with God, but rather a lifestyle of godliness because, it, because it's the right thing to do, what we have been called to do. And so it's not just an occasional doing the nice thing, but it is a lifestyle. The fourth thing that we, that we need to understand about preparing for eternity is that difficulties prepare us for eternity. Difficulties train us, they prepare us, they, they mature us, they get us ready. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17 for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. My friend, the difficulties that you're going through here on earth, the difficulties that you're having, whether they be medical difficulties or financial or, or uh, just any other kind of family problems, you know, just there's so many things that we go through in life. Those things that we're suffering understand that that's part of boot camp. God is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's a promise from 2 Corinthians 4.17. So take inventory of your circumstances, the difficult things that you're dealing with in life. I'm telling you, I've known people, I just don't understand how they, they make it from day to day. They have some difficulties that just overwhelm me. Uh, from just knowing that they're going through some of these difficulties. But God is preparing them for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The fifth thing that we need to understand about preparing for eternity is that we're to manage the temporary for the eternal. We're to manage the temporary, that's here on earth, for the eternal. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 verses 5 through 7. 2 Corinthians 5, starting with verse 5. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. The very thing that he's talking about is eternity. The, that's that time to come. We're picking up with verse 5. But this is what he's saying. He who has prepared us for this very thing, eternity, is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. You have Holy Spirit in you as a guarantee that all of this is going to happen. I mean, why would you have Holy Spirit living in you and leading you and guiding you and, and directing you and giving you insight if there wasn't a purpose and a plan? The Holy Spirit is your guarantee. So we are, verse 6 says, so we are always of good courage. 
We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, what's faith? Remember our definition of faith. Trusting obedience to the known will of God. Trusting obedience to the known will of God. That's what faith is, and that's how we're to walk. We're to walk by trusting obedience to the known will of God and not by sight, not seeing what's going on and making a decision about what we're supposed to do, but rather letting God lead us and show us and, and design uh, his plan for our lives. The sixth thing that we do to prepare for eternity is to understand that we are on an eternal mission. You are already an eternal being. You already exist eternally. You, not the physical body that you have, but the you inside of you is eternal. Ephesians chapter 3, uh, starting with verse 10, says this, Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are already on an eternal mission. What you are doing now is the preparation phase, if you will, for what you are going to be doing after you get to heaven. And then I want us to close with this one final point about um, preparing for eternity. And it's this. Faith is preparation for eternity. That's similar to what we just looked at. But faith, trusting obedience to the known will of God, is preparation for eternity. I want you to look at 1 Timothy. He's a Quite a few little verses here that we're going to look at, but um, but uh, turn to First Timothy chapter six, and we'll start with verse twelve. Boy, these are great words for us as we prepare for eternity. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in approachable light or unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Now, I want to go back up to the beginning of that little uh, passage that we just read, and I want you to key in on what we've been talking about today. Fight the good fight of faith, trusting obedience to the known will of God. Stay focused on that and take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. You are called to eternal life. You are an, listen to this, you are an eternal ambassador. You are called as an ambassador for, for heaven, basically. The Bible says that uh, you know we're not of this world, that uh, we're here on a mission, basically. And so you're an ambassador. You are an eternal ambassador. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good a confession in the presence of many witnesses. So this is our mission, folks. We're here on earth now, preparing for eternity. And the role that we play and the emphasis that we make on, on that uh, determines our value for eternity. I really encourage you to take this coming week and look for opportunities to make an eternal impact on somebody's life. Use the opportunities, those divine appointments that come into your life, to make an eternal impact on somebody. You may not even know that you're doing it, but you plan, decide already in, in your heart that you're going to let God use you to make an eternal difference in people's lives this week. Let's pray. 
Father, I pray that as we uh, finish up this lesson, that you will give us a, a sense of motivation and desire and destiny to accomplish what it is you want to accomplish in our lives now as we prepare for eternity. Father, from the very beginning of time, from the, found, the very foundations of the earth, you were planning for eternity. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to see that and apply that in our lives and uh, make us the eternal ambassadors that you've called us to be. I pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Now, next week, uh, there's a very slight possibility that we will be able to start meeting physically in, a, oh, in the middle of August possibly the 16th. It's a very slight possibility, very small possibility, but it's there. And uh, we're, we're, we're just kind of watching things and waiting to see what the government has to say and what they'll allow us to do. And believe me, we're not going to do anything that is uh, putting people at risk, certainly not in, in, our, in our class. So um, I, I, I'm planning on that at this point, just kind of up in limbo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a shorter Bible study starting next Sunday, uh, a shorter Bible series uh, to take us up to that date, uh, just in case we actually do get to meet together. And if we don't, uh, then we'll, we'll get into something else. But I feel like God's leading me to, to do this uh, three-Sunday series uh, called, What's Your Ministry? What is your ministry? Many, and, and I'm afraid that most, Christians have no idea what their ministry is. Uh, you know, it's, it, I mean, if, it's kind of like a multiple choice. Well, I, I'm supposed to be good, and I'm supposed to help people, and like you say, I'm supposed to be a blessing, and so forth and so on. Well, those are all things that we're all supposed to be doing, but what's your ministry? What is your called ministry? And uh, people don't really know what their ministry is, and because of that, they find themselves frustrated in their spiritual life because... They don't really have a goal. They don't really have a focus. They, they don't see themselves being used by God for His purpose and His glory. And so uh, they wonder what's going on. And so because of that, they find themselves frustrated in their spiritual life. They believe they're called. They believe that God has a plan for them. They just don't know what it is. Yet the Bible says that you, you have a ministry. Uh, it's very clearly stated that you have a ministry. So what is it? That's what we're going to be taking a look at over the next three weeks. How do you discover your ministry and start implementing it and putting it to work? Uh, discover your ministry. So plan on studying with us over the next three weeks, all right? Um, let's, uh, let's wrap things up here because I know you have... Uh, can we go to buffets yet? Are buffets open yet? I guess we have to be really careful if we go to those. And by the way, how do you eat with a mask on? I've, I've wondered that. Um, we're going to uh, wrap things up, and I hope that you'll join us starting next Sunday as we uh, look again at uh, the Word of God and how to apply it in our lives and, and make sure that we're filling and fulfilling the destiny that God has for us. I hope you have a great, great week. I love you guys. I'm praying for you. Pray for each other. Bless each other. Minister to each other. Uh, but, uh, plan on, but plan on doing that on your time. Right now, you need to go away. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing. 